Um, good evening, thanks for joining. Well, my name's Lee Morris, I'm CEO of Manx Wildlife Trust, and this evening, live on Facebook, um, we're going to be talking about my two years spent on the island of St Helena in the South Atlantic Ocean. So, thanks for joining. This should have been done probably in the church hall on the Isle of Man, where I am now, uh, but because of coronavirus and social distancing and stay at home, uh, we've decided not to scrap my talk, we'd do it instead, we'd, we'd do it virtually and we'd do it online. So I've got the, the lovely task of probably for 45 minutes or so telling you about two years on St Helena. I joined Max Wildlife Trust in January 2020 as the CEO and immediately prior to that had spent the last two years based on St Helena. Um, people asked me to do a talk when they heard about um, the fact that I'd spent this time on St Helena because they, they, they'd heard what an interesting and special place it was. Um, and so I was delighted to do so. So, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to cover things about where St Helena is initially, a little bit about the culture of the island, the people of the island, the history of the island, and then very much about the spectacular natural environment, and that's both land and marine, and it, and it is spectacular. Um, also about the agriculture and horticulture, where I spent uh, much of my time working, a little bit about waste management, I also did some consultancy around waste management and that whole concept of, of waste on small islands uh, is very interesting. Um, and uh, towards the end and probably during the talk I'm also going to be drawing some comparisons between St Helena and the Isle of Man where I'm based. So um, without further ado, two years on St Helena. So this first picture was actually taken, I think all the pictures in this presentation were taken by me, bar maybe one or two, which I'll, I'll highlight, but, but certainly this one was taken out of an, an aeroplane window. And St Helena is a lump of volcanic rock that literally sticks out of the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. And where is it? Well, here on the map you can see where St Helena has been, has been marked, um, and its nearest neighbour is Ascension Island, which is over 800 miles away, and then over a 1,000 miles uh, to the east, you've got the west coast of Southern Africa. So St Helena is very, very isolated. As an island, um, it's 10 miles by 6, so that gives you some, some guidelines to it. So it's, it's a lump of rock, and the main population, uh, although there's people spread around the island, the main population is in the capital on Jamestown, which is in the north west coast, um, and that's also the leeward side of the island. So all the prevailing winds come in this way, come in from the, the, the south east, push up against the island, uh, and the, the population is in the north. St Helena's history. So, I could talk for hours about this. I'm trying to cover everything in probably 45-50 minutes max, so I'm just going to touch around here, but the important thing I'd like everyone to understand when they, they watch and listen to this is that St Helena, because of where it is, you know, roughly halfway between Africa and South America, Historically, it was a really important staging post, so people would land there, and of course when they land there, they start to populate there, and then the island mixes, so the, the island population, the saints that we'll talk about, they, they were very much um, a population of people that's evolved from different mixes of people that have come to the island in different ways. Um, but boats, as a shipping point, people would stop off. In effect, it becomes a, a motorway service station, a uh, crop of ships crossing the sea. Um, and I don't know, I can't credit that, that painting, but certainly it's listed as one of the, the old ones of St Helena. Napoleon. Many people will have heard about St Helena because of Napoleon. And that's the place where after the Battle of Waterloo, the, the British sent Napoleon to be exiled. And he actually spent his last days there and died there. Um, and when you go to St Helena, which I hope many of you will, there's two, well there's, there's, there's many Napoleonic sites, but the two that are most commonly visited are uh, the top there on the picture, you can see the house in Longwood, Napoleon's house, which has tried to remain just as he left it, you know, so the, the bed that he died in is still there, the snooker table that he played on is still there, many of the furnishings, etc. And then the, the bottom picture there is actually Napoleon's tomb, Napoleon's grave. Now interestingly, he was buried on the island, but then a few years later the French returned, um, took away his body and took it back for a, a state burial in France. But the actual site of the original burial is there. So you can actually visit Napoleon's tomb and his burial site 
but his remains are no longer there. So Napoleon, people know St Helena, they think Napoleon. This is a classical view of um, looking down from somewhere near Alarm Forest on the lower reaches, looking down into that valley into Jamestown. It gives you an idea of the topography of the island. Um, you, the, the ship you see in the bay, occasionally ships would come in, that's the supply ship, the MV Helena, which we'll come back to later. But you can see there this narrow little valley of, of population that is the capital city of Jamestown. This is a, a classic tourist shot with the signpost. Um, when you get down into the valley, there's, there's a famous attraction called Jacob's Ladder. It's 699 steps. And probably two, three times a year, there are various races, timed races. So one at a time, similar to the TT, where it's time trialled, and you go up the ladder. Now, I think while I was there, I went probably, maybe climbed it three times. Once I tried to do it really quick, I did beat the 10 minutes, which isn't quick. The record's about just over five minutes, but you are running up to do that. 699, very big steps. Um, it's quite vertiginous as well from the top, but Jacob's Ladder. The saints and the culture of the people that live on the island uh, is wonderful. I very much um, embrace the culture of waving to people every day in the car, you, you know everyone, and whereas, you know, I moved to the Isle of Man and people say you're moving to a, a small island and there's, you know, there's only 85,000 people and pretty much if you speak to someone, they're likely to know someone else that knows you. St Helena, four and a half thousand people, ten miles by six. Everyone probably not only knows everyone, I quite quickly and they're actually related to everyone. And because of that, it's a very, very, you know, close-knit close, close -knit community. Community is very important, the people are lovely. And at various times in the year, there were different parades, be for St Helena Day, or the governor arriving, or different um, occasions. And, and this is one where there were, there were floats from the different communities. This one's from Harford community. Um, again, other aspects of Saint culture, the traditional fishing with bamboo poles, uh, then typically eaten on a fish fry, which is very traditional. Uh, and then the top picture is one of the farmers of Saint Helena, Martin Joshua, who just won first prize for his hydroponic farm at the Agricultural Crafts Country Fair. So community and community involvement is intrinsic in the island. Similarity with the Isle of Man is that although Saint Helena is a UK overseas territory and the Isle of Man is a Crown dependency, there are some comparisons, there are some similarities. Both, for example, have a governor. So this is one of the days where the, the, the governor, Sir Philip Rushbrook, had arrived and he's, it's a small picture but he's there in the middle of the picture uh, doing his welcome or his opening address after he just arrived on the island. What's really great in terms of the parades is that all those uniformed groups in St Helena, be it the scouts, the guides, the police, etc, when there's a parade they are there. Uniformed music down the down the street. So that was again one example when the governor arrived. The sea, 10 by 6 mile island in the middle of the South Atlantic was already, I talked about it being a staging post for ships landing and a, a place where, you know, to fill up and supply. The, the sea and the supply to the island is everything and for many many years a, a series of one-off ships have arrived and, and certainly when we got to the island the RMS the Royal Mail ship St Helena was the supply ship and that would arrive once a month bringing not only supplies but also it was the, the bus in effect. It took you five days by boat from Cape Town to get to St Helena and then um, you also had the option of then carrying on for another two days to go to Ascension Island and that was the, that was the culture of the island. Now um, when we arrived there in January 18, it was just coming to the end of the Royal Mail ship St Helena. The airport, which I'm going to come to shortly, had just recently been opened, and the, 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 the Royal Mail ship was going. So actually, it was really great to be there on the last day. And, and what you can see here is a picture from the, the send-off for the RMS. And literally, uh, the island, there was, there was more than a few people in tears because of the, the whole blood of the island It was connected to this ship. It brought everything in, it took everyone away, and people either worked on it or one of their friends or family worked on it for many, many years. So the, the RMS Centralina is no more. Um, 
this actually was the classic way to arrive. Now, because I certainly felt that the RMS was such an important part of the island story f for me, I took the opportunity on my own to, to jump on the RMS. I left my wife in um, Jamestown working and, and went off for five days quite early on in, in our time there to go on board and experience the journey on the RMS to Ascension Island and back. And while I was there, I met some conservation people on Ascension. But, but that's the classic now arriving on the RMS into Jamestown. Um, and it was a lovely culture, but again, being on board in the last, the last voyage, the penultimate voyage of the RMS was, was, a, was a privilege, I have to say. Uh, and certainly it gave me that little sense of just how important it is. But a classic picture of arriving into Jamestown. The airport. If you Google St Helena Airport, and I encourage you to do that, lots will come up. Um, I'm not going to talk about some of the bad press, because I think it's a wonderful thing for the island. But for, for a long time there was the debate on the island, went on for many years I'm told, about does the island need an airport, does it not need an airport. The decision was taken by the British government to help the island de de develop, that an airport was key. And so the, the airport was built. Um, and then for various reasons it didn't open for a year or so, maybe two years, but it opened in October 2017. So when, when, when I arrived on the island uh, January 2018, it was, it was open. They were a few months into operation. Now just in terms of remoteness, if we put the, the current situation with COVID-19 to one side, because currently there's no flights from South Africa into St Helena, um, there is there is a scheduled one flight a week. In busy times of year, two flights a week. So everyone you see in the airport also happens to work uh, in the department store or in the bank, etc. And it will be really interesting as the island develops and hopefully gets more flights, how that, how that evolves. But this is a picture, again, I took out the aeroplane window and you can see how the airfield, the runway, is perched high up on the cliffs. It's about a thousand feet up. Um, and that's got challenges and I won't go into the details. I, I love aeroplanes and I could talk about the intricacies of the aviation in and out of St Helena for a long time, but, but not for today. But the airport, the, the bit I'd really like you all to understand is just how important that airport is to the island now. Um, you know, that flight coming in, it's a quick connection, even just things for like medivacking, people in and out. It's not five days anymore to get to a sophisticated hospital, it's, it's, it's four hours. So transformational for the island. Um, and the ambition is that that will allow the island to develop, certainly in terms of its tourism. You add a broadband cable in which is coming and suddenly people can, can work there. As we're all learning in this digital world, you know, you can do a lot through a, a bit of digital technology if you've got the right connection. So, St Helena Airport. It is one of the, probably actually, last point on the airport, that, because there has been some bad press about it. My take on it now is that they're so... The, the, the procedures and the safeguards are so stringent and strong that ironically, I believe, and I know a bit about aeroplanes, is that it's probably one of the most safest airports to fly to in the world now. So please don't let, ever, let that ever put you off. It's spectacular, it's very, very safe, and it's very well managed. Okay, there is now a supply ship. So the RMS sent Helena left, and they replaced it with the MV Helena. And the MV Helena arrives once a month. Now, in that culture, again, of being remote, just drawing that analogy back to the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man gets, I guess it gets a few ships a day. It gets, once comes across from Haitian, it gets some from Liverpool, it gets some from Dublin. Imagine a world where you get one boat a month. That's it, one boat a month. And if it doesn't come on that boat, it doesn't come. Um, little bits air freight, of course, but that is astronomically expensive. So the MV Helena brings things once a month. Um, and an example of that, when I was actually interviewed for the post on the Isle of Man, I was asked about living on a remote island and explained about St Helena. And the analogy I use is that, you know, I'm used to a place where you can buy apples for three days a month, maybe four. The boat comes in, they unload the fresh fruit and veg, it goes into the shops, you can buy it. And once it's gone, halas, finished, gone, you've got tinned and maybe frozen for the, for the rest of the month. So um, you see a bit of broccoli, you buy it straight away. It's, it's a different scale of, of remoteness there. But actually, I mean, I certainly loved it. I, I, I was very comfortable. Um, some of the shops are great as well. Shopping in Jamestown or shopping in St Helena. Um, again, similar, there's, there's, I go into Peel and the Isle of Man now, and there's lovely little village shops that you can go in and find, find things that you didn't expect to find. But certainly on St Helena, this was, sorry for the other shops, you were all lovely, but this was my favorite shop. So it's called the Emporium. 
you could go in there and find all sorts. I won't list them, but you could, you know, pretty much. You, you buy everything, oh, it would be bizarre. You could buy everything from an air rifle to a plastic toy to a, some sellotape to pesticides to a padlock. You could, the list goes on. So you could pretty much buy everything in the Emporium. And the fact, if you can see on the picture, that it's actually on Napoleon Street made it even more special. So the, the, the shopping culture was, was lovely. Um, one of me, I'm not going to put loads of holiday snaps in, but the reason I put this in is that this is me cutting off the, the lock from the shipping container. So when we decided to go to St Helena for two years, um, we got the option of using a shipping container. So arrived there, it takes eight to ten weeks to get there, goes from the UK to South Africa, then onto the ship, but then it was the RMS and the RMS brought it to the island. So in there there's a Ford Fiesta, a load of boxes, some fishing tackle, some scuba diving kit, which I'll come back to later, um, everything board games, the lot, um, loads of tins of things that we thought we'd need. So a shipping container, and although I knew that the world revolves around shipping containers, to be in that microcosm of an island where, you know, things arrive in shipping containers. If, if I ordered something by Amazon, it would take six to eight weeks to get there, and it would come as a part of a bulk order in a, from, the shipping, from, a, from, a, from a shipping company in a shipping container and then you'd decamp the shipping container and you'd be all there finding the bits that were for you so very interesting to be to be part of that culture as well um, in terms of exploring the wonder we're going to come on now to a bit more about the spectacular natural environment of St Helena which is gobsmacking so how do you find your way around well I've avoided putting another map up but imagine if I put the map of St Helena up again and there was walks dotted around the island, marked walks, they call them post box walks, so you, you buy your little book, you go on a trail, typically they'd end up down in a little bay or on the top of a peak, and when you get there there's a box with a stamp and you stamp your book and you log it, so if you like collecting things as, as I do, post box walks are great. Um, all of them have got some interpretation panels at the start, this one's at the, the, the board at Manatee Bay, um, and you follow your walks in, and, and the little island you can see there is Speary Island. Again, another little beautiful piece, but, but post box walks, and they have some spectacular views. Again, that's one of me just overlooking Speary Island, which is, again, gobsmacking. And the, the word post box walk is interesting, though. This is actually one of my wife at the, the end. I think this one is actually at Sharks Valley, one of the walks at Sharks Valley, where quite a few of the walks, you wouldn't get away with it in the Lake District. People would close them, probably. Um, I'm not saying they're unsafe or dangerous, but you'd certainly need good sturdy footwear and need to sit on your bum occasionally to get down them, but, but, but spectacular. And it allows you, in a very organised way, to explore some of the, the, the beautiful places on the island. Um, the history of the island is everywhere. So as you go around, I talked about Napoleon and his house and his, uh, his, his, his tomb, but there are signs, there's gun placements, there's battlements around the island, some spectacular places that actually you can just walk into. because of the footfall, or the lack of footfall, these are not places with a tourist barrier, or a pay point, or a, or a guidebook, because there just isn't enough people visiting the island yet that would justify that. But the history is everywhere. This is, this is actually on one of the islands, a little island called Egg Island, um, and this is Coburn's Battery. And Coburn's Battery was a place where it was, it was described as the most remote outpost in the British Army. So apparently one person, one soldier, was put on this battery on this little island for a month with supplies for a month and that was him there, or yeah, him, for, for the month. So Coburn's battery. Another spectacular sight. I've seen this in a few places, but, but the coloured earth, and this is completely natural, just how the soil of the rock has, has, has eroded and to create this, this coloured earth pattern. Again, I'm putting a couple of tourist ones in now. So this is a, another place where the tourists, when, it, when one of the cruise ships arrives on the island and they get minibused around, a stop point now is, a, is a, a little bay parking place where they can overlook this, which is the heart-shaped waterfall. And you can see clearly there in the image why it's called the heart-shaped waterfall. So what did I do while I was there? Well, I did have a, my wife says, a mixed portfolio, but I did some wonderful things both for the St. Helena government, uh, also for the St. Helena National Trust, and as a consultant uh, for the Blue Marine Foundation. So when I first arrived, one of the things I did was actually work alongside a, a new marine conservation team as a consultant, helping Beth Taylor, the, the, the leader of that team, set up the, the new marine team 
to help with the conservation of the island's new marine protected area which goes all the way around the island within its territory and part of our work there was was to support and recruit local people into the team get them trained for example teaching them how to do beach cleans uh, we found noodles on the beaches we were setting up education programs etc so so very much been in at the start supporting and helping that team evolve now in terms of the marine environment just a little bit now about how special it is again comparison with the Isle of Man the Isle of Man is yes very renowned for its basking sharks. St Helena also has big sharks and they're whale sharks um, and St Helena and I met the the scientists from Georgia Aquarium in the US who come across annually to do a lot of the data collection and, and through conversations and watching their presentations and reading lots of have, have realized just how special St Helena is so any of you that dive or know about the marine environment you will know that there's many places in the world where you can see or hope to see a whale shark, the biggest fish in the, in the ocean. Now the thing that's special about St Helena is that if you went to, for example, uh, Cancun in Mexico, you, you might find lots of whale sharks at certain times of the year, but I'm told that they are typically relatively small males, all males. If you go to Ningaloo Reef in Australia, I'm told that they're typically, again, they're single sex. If you go to the Galapagos Islands, you find huge big female singles. But on St Helena, the real special thing is that you get big males, big females, at the same time, in the same place, in huge numbers. This, this, this term mass aggregation. So here's one whale shark. Uh, this lump of rock is actually called the barn, aptly named. So off Barn Cap was the, was the place where we would typically go and find whale sharks. And, and I could have put thousands of pictures of whale sharks in the, in the presentation. So um, I'm just going to put one underwater one and I'm going to show you one little bit of video clip to try and encapsulate just how awesome they are. So this actually was a picture I took that the St. Helena Tourism Board use on the front of their whale shark leaflet, which I think is pretty cool. And it does show you the scale of one of the, the, the world's biggest fish. Um, there were actually people from uh, a, a film company called Green Renaissance there that were, that were free diving with me while we were doing some filming, but, but there's a, a picture of a whale shark. Now, I am going to show you a little bit of a video clip now. There's a whale shark, isn't that beautiful? Now, what's interesting is that I turn around, because I've nearly been run over by two more whale sharks that were coming from the, from the back side. This was just one day when I was out on a boat, and we stopped the boat, and we counted 25 to 30 whale sharks around the boat. And I know from speaking to people in the St. Helena National Trust that they've been on the boat with Georgia Aquarium and they've had like 50 plus whale sharks around them at the same time. But imagine, these are 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 metre long animals. So the marine environment is not just about whale sharks. St. Helena has a very special marine environment per se. So here's just four examples. From a, that are endemics or certainly local endemics to St Helena and Ascension Island, the red slipper lobsters, um, the cup coral, the, the St Helena butterfly fish, oh, and the, the Chilean devil ray is not an endemic, it's a, low, it's a visitor to the island. But three endemics there and another megafauna that visits the island. There's also cetaceans, whales and dolphins that visit St Helena and probably about a month or two that the, the whale shark season typically is January through till end of April. Um, sometimes into May, I saw a couple in the Mays, I was there, but pretty much January to mid-April is the peak. And then roughly from about July onwards, you start looking for humpback whales. And humpback whales, typically mothers and their calves, turn up around St Helena. Uh, and this was a picture I actually took um, with, a, with a camera connected to the binoculars while sat on the cliffs. And quite regularly we could go around the island, sit down and watch humpback whales from Southwest Point, or you go watch them from Barn Cap and you see them. So the humpback whale season comes. And there's lots of dolphins as well. So this is not a good picture, but I need to tell you this story because it was wonderful. So, and it's a, probably an example of just how spectacular St Helena's natural or marine environment is. So one day in my first year, I can't, I'd only been there a few months, it was probably coming up to the, probably halfway through the first year, and someone casually said something about um, have the dolphins arrived yet for the flying fish season. It was a very off the cuff remark and of course I asked the question and then discovered that probably for four to six maybe even eight weeks a year typically you've got the, the bottlenose dolphins, that the big population around the island are pan-tropical spotted dolphins. 
the, 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 there's three species, the, the one you see the most are the, pan, are the spotted, then you also see the bottlenose. But the bottlenose dolphins herd at night flying fish into the harbour where the, the lights are on the, the jetty. And the fish, the fish take off, hit the wall or hit the boats, drop in the, drop in the sea, the, the dolphins eat them. And I, yeah, I went regularly through those months of the year watching them. Um, again, it's not the best picture. I don't, I don't have the very best terrestrial camera. But you'll hopefully be able to see there that here's, a, here's one of the saints with the flying fish that had actually taken off, hit the wall, landed on the jetty uh, to get away from the dolphins and was just about to be tossed back in where I'm pretty sure a dolphin then came and grabbed it. But imagine being able to watch, you know, you see these on the Attenborough documentaries and I used to just take a flask of tea down, sit on the wall and watch the dolphins chase the flying fish in on an evening. And typically, if you hung on, they'd come. Quite often, it would be like a little gallery it would get to nine and a half, nine at night, and people start to drip away. I think one night I waited until about half ten, and then had the best hour I'd ever had with them. Um, spe spectacular. Um, I also, in my evenings, um, and it was predominantly night dives in, in, in evenings after doing work, it, it was helping out with a project, a Darwin project. Um, I love to scuba dive, putting the two together, why wouldn't you? And there was a project there um, to actually get the baseline data around two of the main lobster species on the island, typically or, or predominantly these which are the spiny crayfish. So this was organised um, by a lovely a Yorkshire German I call him, uh, Ralph Bublitz, um, who's, who's married a Yorkshire girl, lives in Yorkshire but he's German. Um, but that's Ralph's second left. Um, Craig, the guy stood up, is one of the two dive operators on the island who, and we took it in turns to go out with them on the boats and then me and Carl are on the right hand side. But we were going out typically two or three nights a week to do double night dives. And what were we doing while we were underwater? Well, we were first of all sexing them. So the top left picture there, that's a female. You can see the orange eggs. You've got the pleopods that, that surround the eggs. And after a few, you get to pick, you can pick one up even without eggs and quickly see from the size of the, the pleopods, whether it's a male or a female. We were measuring the shells, the carapaces. Um, recording all the data. The bottom left one is one of the cutest ones. You didn't, you didn't find so many juveniles, but when you do, they're really cute. Um, and then the bottom right picture is actually, we went through a whole test system of, of attaching acoustic tags to the back of crayfish so that we could then, and we set the tagging system out on boys, on chains and sunk them underwater, put the, and then caught and tagged crayfish and the data has now been collected so that that can measure their range. So again there's a whole talk here and Ralph would do it far better than me and I've heard him do it a few times but the bottom line is it's the baseline data. What they are, how many they are, how far do they roam. But, but a fascinating project and as a, a volunteer citizen science it was a lovely thing to be involved with. Um, also in, in volunteering and diving just because I love to dive we, we organised dive litter picks um, and certainly one of the things I was keen to do that we did was we linked into the the bigger data sets and, and I think that's important in any small island if you've got data about be it marine litter or citizen science or or counts etc to plug that into the larger data sets and we, and we did that through dive against debris and, and also through the international coastal cleanup where there's now a line on Centralina. Um, just to show you how special it is don't please try and read this text but there was two occasions where you know, I personally found things underwater and people, it wasn't just me, other people were finding things as well. So I didn't actually find a new species of fish, but I think it was the only second recording of this cusk eel. It's a cusk eel. And actually when you start to look for it, myself and Anthony, one of the other dive operators, we saw them quite a few times on night dives. So cusk eels, but there were still things that you could find. Um, talking about things that you can find, talking about the history, there's some wrecks, quite a few interesting historic wrecks around St Helena um, and in terms of anything around a wreck you, you never touch it because it's part of the historic collection. Um, but again on one dive just in the bay, myself and Carl were diving and came across a pot that was intact. It was nowhere near a wreck site so we took it up, thought it was interesting and took it straight to the St Helena Museum who were immediately blown away. They found some research, got some papers, contacted the marine um, archaeological society and they're pretty certain this is a pot that's probably four to five hundred years old an olive jar and there's a whole paper I've got it on the taxonomy of olive jars and you can pretty much date that to being about 450 years old and that was just laid on the seabed so 
um, there's, there's, a lot to be, there's a lot to be seen on St Helena. Um, right, if we come above the water now, that's no more scuba diving, sorry, or, or maybe you'll be glad to hear that, we need to get to the land. So this was actually going on to Egg Island, so this was a day going on to Egg Island to do some monitoring about one of the seabirds there, um, and which are the, the, the St Helena storm petrels, or storm petrels. There's some work being done, I think by Anna Lee Beard, who's actually trying to, the, the hypothesis is that there may be a, a separate subspecies, I don't know much about that, but I think that's the case. But certainly what was interesting was to, to go on the island and horticultural plant pots being used as nesting boxes. You, you cut a hole in the side of the pot, you put the drip tray on the top and suddenly you've got, then you put some rocks on the top and here's one where we've lifted the drip tray off which is the lid in effect uh, and there's a, storm, there's a petrol inside, you can, you can just about make out the hole to the bottom um, and then you can handle them, you can ring them, you can measure them etc. So it, it was a maintenance project. Okay, and now we're going to go terrestrial. So this is the central point of the island. So this is Diana's Peak, it's the green middle. Uh, it's a height of a, just over 800 metres, and I'm hoping that on the picture, what you should be able to make out, that all at the, the, the sort of the top right, right hand side of the picture is, is tree ferns. And then as you go across the slope, and certainly down, it becomes greyer, shinier, and that's actually flax. And if we just talk about the plant conservation on the island for a, a minute or so, so back in the day when people first arrived, the, I don't believe there's any paintings of what the, the island looked like before anyone lived here. But anecdotally, people think that the whole island was covered in small trees, it was forested, forested bush. And over the time people would arrive, they cut trees down for firewood, um, People introduced goats and the goats munch everything so they roamed around and ate everything. Of course if you eat the vegetation when it rains the soil no longer has anything to hold on to, there's no roots so that washes away and suddenly fertile forest slopes become blank rock slopes. So there was issues and, and then the other big moment as I interpret it for the island in terms of plant conservation was when flax was introduced. So flax was introduced because it can be used to make jute ropes. It grows really well. So First World, Second World War, Korean War, St Helena exported lots of flax for rope making. But unfortunately for the natural vegetation, flax is also extremely invasive. And when you drive around some of the, the higher peak slopes in St Helena, you can see that there's a huge amount where it's just completely covered in flax. Now, over probably the last 20 plus years, conservation initiative and, and, to, and, and longer to be fair but significant peak as it's come on and, and it's crescendoing with, with actually trying to address that balance and they're trying to do it in different ways so the first thing that they're, they're doing is that you know there's a team of people that work up in the peaks mainly local people and they're cutting the flax down uh, and having spent just a couple of days with these guys it's you know it's tough physical hard work they're tied on ropes going off the sides of these slopes hacking flax out so they're, they're cutting the flax away. What they're also doing then is growing plants to reintroduce. Now, um, what it really needs is the guy that's the expert in this, Lawrence Milan, to be telling you all about this. And, and, and the, the, the few conversations that I had with Lawrence um, is, a, is an ecologist, horticulturist. And, and certainly what they're trying to do is not simply cut it out and put back, but it's more of a case of, of, of let things get shaded out. And, and again, it needs his wisdom. But, but there's a stepped approach to ecological horticulture, you know, restoration horticulture going on on the island that's making a clear difference. Um, this is just one of the, the projects that's been set up in the Peaks Nursery, uh, and this is the bellflower, and, and they're actually collecting seeds. So what you're looking at there is, is a large bellflower that's been planted in almost a seed bank, a seed orchard rather, just so that they can be harvested um, and, and, then, and then sown in the nursery. So little ecological solutions to propagation problems. This is a picture taken actually on Diana's Peak, now looking down. So you can see that we're surrounded by um, cabbage trees and there's tree ferns and then as you look down the hill you go into some pasture land. You can't really see much of the flax. The, the, there's actually some flax about halfway up on the right hand side you can see a slope of flax uh, and then it goes down you can see some eucalyptus forest again which are uh, um, exotic trees brought in. You can see the little nursery in the middle of the picture and then right in the background to give you a context is the airport. You know, the whole island, remember, is only 10 miles long. So when you're on Diana's Peak, you can literally 
do a 360 and, and see the lot, which is um, also quite a view. It's not all up in the peaks, so plant and terrestrial conservation all goes, also goes down onto the plains. Again, you've got the, the runway in the background to give you some context. One of the key projects on the, on the lower areas of St Helena is the Millennium Forest. Um, and here what you're looking at is, is a plantation of gumwoods, uh, not just gumwoods, but many, many gumwoods and other native species have been planted around since the millennium to, to, to reforest a, a huge area of the lowland. No talk on St Helena or a talk about the Millennium Forest would be complete without putting a picture of a wirebird in. Um, this is not my picture, I've, I've left the guy's name on the bottom of the slide that I took it from off Google, Google Images. I did see, or well, we did see lots of wirebirds, but my, I don't have a camera lens that's that long, and although I've seen lots of them and got a few through binoculars, not anywhere near as good as that, but this is St Helena's only endemic land bird. Uh, it's a little plover, St Helena plover is its other name, it's on the flag, so when you look at the flag, the little uh, above the ship on the, the badge on the side, the little bird there on the yellow background is the wirebird, so St Helena wirebird. And, and I've met people who are, you know, bird enthusiasts or uh, even one that was a self-professed twitcher, that immediately I mentioned St Helena was, I need to go there to see the St Helena plover. So it's clearly got some, some importance in the birding world. Um, I also should talk about scorpions. Certainly where we lived, quite regularly we'd find scorpions in the same way I'd find a spider in Peel. Um, I did actually get stung by one once um, and then immediately thought, is that, how, is that going to be a hospital trip? Thankfully it wasn't. I can speak from my own experience, it wasn't as bad as a bee sting or a wasp sting. But, um, you know, I still, uh, I still got the job occasionally of catching them and carefully releasing them outside. So, scorpions. Um, a lot of my work on St Helena was around the development of agriculture. There's a, there's, there's a community of farmers, a lot of them work small scale, some are, some are mixed farms, they've got arable and stock, um, and there's a government agricultural natural resources division that, that support and look after and do extension work for the farmers. I was asked um, on arrival on St Helena if I would help deliver some work for the farmers development and that was very much around agricultural skills. So the first thing that I did was spend about a month, month and a half speaking to lots of people, visiting the farms, getting an understanding of it um, and these are just some of the farmers that I met. The farming on St Helena, typically it's open ground. This is the largest open ground site on that. It, it looks very very extensive, that's the biggest field on the island. Um, so this is at Longwood, Longwood Field, the main, the main agricultural area, um, and there that's actually, yeah, again, the biggest farm going, brassicas, leeks, etc. Now, the island has also, over recent years, in, expanded its own tunnel production, um, loosely in hydroponics, so growing things in, in liquid solution. Typically, if you know your hydroponics, open circuit rather than being totally closed circuit, but nevertheless, so tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, lettuces, etc. These are all crops now that the, the government, the St. Helena government, has invested time and support in to enable growers to produce more food for the island. This is an image of, of some of the upland pasture. There's, as I've already mentioned, sheep, cattle and goats on the island. Um, this isn't the best piece of pasture, but the reason I put this in is to identify that actually there is a weed issue. But also, if you can see some of the yellow flowers there, another comparison with the Isle of Man is that there's an awful lot of ulex of gorse on the island. So gorse is a, is, a, is, a, is a prevalent plant across St Helena as well as the Isle of Man. In terms of supply to the island, I mentioned the supply ship, the MV Helena, it comes once a month. I mentioned the fact that you could go in a shop and buy broccoli, you bought it quick because there wasn't much there. And there is a challenge for the island in terms of growing more fresh produce. So, this is how this MV Helena is unloaded. These are actually palletfuls of uh, potatoes and onions being unloaded. 
Um, and the island's also getting more and more supplies of other fresh produce in as well. But yet, even with the supply chain coming in and the farmers on the island, the demand uh, is still exceeding the supply currently. Um, here we've got in biosecurity. So I've talked about goats and I've talked about blacks. Um, and I could have talked about a lot of other problems, that living problems, be it weeds or pests, animal pests that came onto the island that have impinged on agriculture. And so now the Centralina government has got a very, very stringent biosecurity policy and team and procedures. Um, and this was some of the, the, the apples that had been arrived on the MV Helena. I spent a, a morning with these guys as they went through and checked them, etc. etc. So the biosecurity levels are extremely high now because of the, the, the learning that the island's gone through previously. In terms of exporting agricultural, the there's no more flax exported uh, currently. There's some people would like to maybe create some artesian um, products that could go off the island, but, but currently the agricultural product that goes off island is coffee. Um, and if you, again, go to Google, go to Fortnum & Mason's or go to Harrods and price up St. Helena coffee, uh, it's, it's very much the finest Yemeni Arabica coffee. So it's got a very high market value and you don't need that much of it, you know, it, 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 it's a good high value crop. And again, there's a few small plantations, coffee plantations on the island, and there's, there's, a, there's some enthusiasm, as there have been for years, I think, to, to try and expand that production and market. But St. Helena coffee, it's very nice. Um, after doing the agricultural skills survey, I also then spent some time working with agricultural government and also the education department developing some upskilling initiatives and, and that ranged from developing, I say, I say this with a smile on my face, every single school on Saint, high school on St. Helena now runs a agriculture, conservation and animal care course in the high school. There's only one high school and they're only testing it but however the ambition is that, that the cohort of, of, of currently all boys doing this will expand and the concept of bringing more conservation and animal care into the curriculum that they aim like it is in the UK will, will attract more people to learn. Um, growers workshops uh, and finally that whole thing about working across the island the bottom right picture it's a group of people but, but the important thing behind that picture is that that's people from multiple government departments farmers, national trust, all the other NGOs working together to try and get a solution to develop agriculture and, and get more young people involved in agriculture and conservation and, and the green environment so it's it, it's quite special you know I, I very much I enjoy doing the work and um, also in this environmental world and I think it's applicable to the Isle of Man to other small islands while I was in St. Helena in my first year I was asked by Blue Marine Foundation if I'd go and do a month's work on Ascension Island and specifically to go and help the Ascension Island government with the final launch and stakeholder engagement around their new waste management strategy. Again, there could be a whole one hour talk about waste management on Ascension Island. Um, this picture isn't the best picture, they've improved it now, but, but typically they collected rubbish, they tipped it out in a pile, they put some fire lighters under it, they lit the fire lighters, it burnt 60 to 90 percent of it, and then they landfilled the rest. The, the Ascension's moved on a lot now with an incinerator similar to the Isle of Man again, uh, but also doing some recycling of products that can be recycled on the island or have got a value that justifies shipping them. So with that learning, I came back to St Helena and, and, and engaged with the waste department on St Helena in the government. And, you know, the waste management on St Helena, there is, a, there is a landfill site. So this is part of the landfill site. This is actually the area where people can just go and dump their own their own waste and people actually call this the, the shop. Well, I, I don't think you can make that out there but um, on the right of the picture there's a red car and just in front of the red car that's, that's my wife with a load of car tyres. So we'd gone to find things to grow stuff in at home so those car tyres became the planters for the, for the next two years. And the other people in the other cars there, they're not dropping things off, they're finding things to go and use at home to make things with. And, and it's very much part of the culture, it's called the supermarket, people rock up and take things away. So that bit is just natural recycling, people just go and take stuff away. If you went to the other cells where the, you know, the RCDs, the bin lorries are tipping the, the, the waste, then you start to analyse what's in there, then of course you've got organic waste, glass, cans, 
metals, etc, etc, etc. And for small islands, well, for the whole world it's an issue, we know that, but for small islands, blimey, certainly what I saw on, on Ascension and Centalina, this is, a, this is a huge issue, and, and many of you will have seen the pictures of the famous island in the Maldives, again, where there's a whole island that's just a dump. So, as a world, we have to do this better, and maybe small islands can be exemplars of how everyone else needs to do it. Why not? Um, so, on Centalina, they are recycling glass. Um, it's not huge scale, it's not, a, it's not a complete solution, but they're doing it. So they're collecting glass in bins, they're crushing up the glass, they're making concrete, they're making concrete blocks. So it's saving a bit of money on the aggregate of buying in sand and gravel. The other thing that they're doing now on Centalina, which I was um, you know, a, a part of, of, of at least facilitating and, and, and motivating to set up, was you know, I had conversations with the, the, the buyers of aluminium cans in, in South Africa. And, and actually aluminium, if you think that everything again, come back to the shipping container, moves around on shipping containers. If you want to send a shipping container from St. Helena to South Africa or from St. Helena to the UK, it's four figure sums. You know, it, it's thousands of pounds to get a shipping container. So unless the value of what's in it far exceeds the shipping cost, you're never going to do that. But aluminium cans, they are worth on the open market, if they're crushed and baled and clean, they're worth between 550 to the best price I saw while I was looking at it, it was £950 per tonne. So you can imagine if you can do that and you can crush them and you can fill up shipping containers, you may not make a fortune, but you're more than covering your costs. And also the aluminium's getting reused again, which is reducing the amount that actually gets made. So I'm going into too much detail now. So I'll step back from aluminium cans, but, but my, my learning from that was around that whole concept of waste management, and particularly in small islands. And um, that whole thing about living sustainably on small islands is important as well. So St. Helena has a wind farm, uh, it's looking to develop more, but, but the big step forward in St. Helena in alternative energy is in solar panels. Um, a, a friend of mine, Carl, he imports solar panels, the price of them is dropping, the technology increasing, the calculations of doing it, and, and certainly in the last few months, we were on the island, many of the businesses in Jamestown are switching from, from mains, as in diesel generated electricity, to solar powered energy. So the island is really taking great steps forward in that way. So what did all this teach me? I'm nearly done. So well done for staying with me and if you're not already, please do ping me questions in the Facebook and I'll, I will reply to them. So um, this is one last lovely picture of the island of St Helena. So it's a beautiful view and, and for me just is something to talk about how, that, how those words, you know, we hear ecosystem services or natural capital or natural environment, these, these buzzwords and what does it mean? Well, I think for St Helena it certainly taught me that an island is a microcosm of everything, you know, agriculture, horticulture, marine conservation that surrounds it, the fishing industry, we haven't talked about the, the tuna, the one line tuna fishing and, and, and everything that goes with that that the education, the waste management, how the supply chain works, that is ecosystems and, and how it all works together. And again, I come back to that opportunity for islands to, to really lead the way. Now, the thing that really, you know, was a key driver for me to go from St. Helena to the Isle of Man was about this concept of I like islands. You know, I've always gone on holiday for years. I've worked in a few. They're lovely places. There was a conference held, um, organised by the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute, and they held one in January, uh, sorry, in 2018, and they also held one in 2019, which I was in, uh, delighted to invite to speak to about the agricultural work. But the beauty of this conference is, it wasn't just a conference for, for St Helena, it was about South Atlantic Islands. So we had people from South Georgia, from the Falklands, from Ascension, from Tristan de Kuna, and all the islands of the South Atlantic came together. And it was quite apparent, very stark to me, of the same issues. You know, in terms of agricultural development, I know that Harper Adams University in the UK have, have helped with Tristan de Kuna. You know, a, a horticultural colleague of mine, Martin Emmett, has been to the Falkland Islands with colleagues to do work there. The same issues on ascension. You know, why do we reinvent wheels? And then you expand it further. And then, and then you think, well, actually, we'll come to my pretty much the last slide now, where I, I want to talk about little bit about the UK Overseas Territories Conservation Forum, 
which isn't just for UK overseas territories, it's for Crown dependencies as well, of which the Isle of Man is a Crown dependency. And if you start looking at the world in that context, then suddenly, not only is it the South Atlantic, but suddenly it's the British Indian Overseas Territory, the Chagos Islands. It's all the Caribbean. And suddenly you start adding more places in, you know, the Channel Islands come into it. And there's that network of small islands. And I just wonder whether there's a bit more to be gained by sharing and cross-fertilising ideas and, and working together even more. Um, so, to finish, so to give a little bit of a comparison, final comparison between St. Helena and the Isle of Man. So if I click up the next slide, you'll see there that I've done an overlay, an outline. It, it's probably 95% scaled right if I've, if I've done it correctly. But that gives you an idea of how big um, the St. Helena is compared to the scale of the Isle of Man. Uh, as I say, both of them are members of the UK Overseas Territories Conservation Forum. We're part of that, of that network, that, that federation. Um, and certainly I'm very excited about been, been remaining in that network and seeing what potential there is for, for the Isle of Man to, to A, learn from others, but also for the Isle of Man, you know, we're a big small island. We can, we can, be, a, we can be a leader with our biosphere banner and all those other elements of, of what the Isle of Man does well. We could actually help some of these smaller, so these smaller territories to, to, to do more, you know, in a very ways, but certainly in conservation. Um, thank you sincerely for watching. I hope you can see my enthusiasm um, it's genuine for St Helena, it's a, it's a tremendous place. Uh, you can fly there, Covid-19 aside, from Johannesburg. You can also, starting to be able to fly there from Cape Town. I would encourage anyone to go. And if you go, don't just go for a week, go for at least two weeks. Plan to do some walking, plan to see some whale sharks, uh, and plan to spend a lot of time waving at people and speaking to people and, and just embracing the culture of St Helena. Um, thank you for listening.